erase the tombstone and raise the standards. They're too valuable to be buried. Servers are dead, but at least we still got the music. Is it ever considered morally correct to qualify anything as a safe addiction? Whoa. Now there's a question worth a thousand words. Or a million, depending on what the vast importance entails to one's desires. I myself can't possibly come up with a definitive answer due to the immense upheaval of complications I receive just trying to rationalize it as such. Because look, I'm gonna be real with you here, I think I have a problem with listening to video game music a little too much. Yeah, you know, that one genre of music often disregarded and thrown miles deep into the pit from the rug it swept under by not only modern public, but the actual publishers themselves. No one may never know the reason for its underrated acknowledgments. Video game music is like an incurable plague gifted by a parasite that's long since become an important part of my life. And it's no exaggeration to confess that my life would be utterly boring as hell if anyone tried to get rid of it. Because in all severe genuine honesty, this invisible black sheep of music has personally taught me so much in life in a multitude of inexplainable reasons that it's become more than just a hobby. It's literally my only source of energy for motivation. It ain't no lethal drug, but DAMN does it make me want more! Additionally, in a general aspect, there's always something so special about video game music that does so much more than providing earworm-inducing or simply amazing tunes bestowed onto the ears. They are also a divine blessing that speaks to the player personally, as if the track they're hearing is its own person in a mystifying way, be it with the atmosphere, style of instruments, emotion, or where the current setting is held in the game the latter credentials of which blends the subjective best flavors in my preferred beverage when it all comes down to variety. The more notably so-called bangers are a satisfying time to give the replay button an existential crisis every once in a while, but the ones with puzzle-like qualities that ultimately creates a separate adventure are a joy to immerse in, regardless of its complexity. Very often the message is completely straightforward, but sometimes, you just have to figure it out yourself. In other words, solve what everything means. That's where the fun begins when listening to soundtracks. The more you replay it, the clearer the message becomes. Thus, a relationship is born. If you're a passionate person like me, that is, who loves to go in depth on describing their favorite soundtracks that isn't just because they're awesome, which is what I'm here to do. And this happens to be the fourth time I've done so on this channel, featuring the one and only Monster Hunter Frontier. I don't even need to describe how artistic this entire orchestral library is. I already wrote a book, it's in the review, go watch it. Though to cement a point, Frontier's soundtrack is unbelievably good to the ridiculous extent that this game is single-handedly liable to officially be in the top three BGM categories by franchise. In addition, each time when I finish a particular game or series with a great selection of music, what I personally call the replay grind phase usually lasts a few months or so until I'm satisfied to move on to something else. 
But wouldn't you believe it when I tell you that this music grind of Frontier has been going on for three years straight and counting? Yeah, I'm that much of an addict. Over that duration of ethereal luxuriousness baptizing the ears, it has become clear to the mind that there are quite a lot more to these sacred masterpieces than a general based monstrous standard of musical performances deserving a standing ovation, courtesy to its melodies alone. By this, I'm referring to the unique detailed messages hidden from within the design. By years of intimate experience and paying way too much close attention to detail, I'll divide a select 15 canvases that stand out to me the most. However, full disclaimer advisory, I will not be including anything too serious or popular like Shang Tian Phase 4, Dele Medila, Tycoon Zemoza, or Guan Zonamu. Most of the time the music speaks for itself, but that's not what I'm going for. And to clarify, unique does not equate to its melody necessarily. For this video specifically, I'm primarily focused on the types of soundtracks that either have the most elemental depth to them or give off a completely different feeling altogether. Though some might argue that all of Frontier's music fit this criteria normally as is, which is true. But like I said earlier, these are the ones that always stood out to me the most in terms of uniqueness. Also, to keep things fair, I won't include the ones I've already described on my remade 10 favorite Monster Hunter soundtrack video. As much as I genuinely love to have the honor talking about how fucking gorgeous Odi Batarasu's theme is for an hour, there needs to be a boundary set in place somewhere. Lastly, this is not a countdown list over what's better than the other. This is simply a non-biased category of examples that own interesting music design choices. And just to give you a better idea on what I'm talking about, Ricordiora, Champion of the Magnetic Field, would match this category perfectly. It's a heroic fanfare that literally personifies how it feels to fight for justice. It prepares to engage and quite literally leads itself to victory. With that being said, I am GBA049, and let's begin the Frontier Music Analysis. <laughs> Start the music! Let's start off with something strong, shall we? I for one am certainly going to have a blast talking about this one, since it's been making me as eager as a stove waiting to reveal its talents by begging to cook up something fresh. If I had to begin with dissecting this rather hot take for a particularly odd combination of instruments trying to innovate itself, it's not usual to hear violins, flutes, or even a sitar for all that matter belonging in a fire-based setting, because more often than not in certain times in video games like 4 Ultimate's Crimson Fatalis, DKCR's Furious Fire, and Samus Returns' Lava Caves, the setting is overrun with brass-related instruments, vocals, and sometimes heavy percussion combined to represent the extreme temperatures that's being presented. Yet Varasaburosu, a pair of blazing horns, completely rebels this notion by coming up with a musical concept of its own. At first when I was introduced to this theme, I thought nothing of it as a Monster Hunter theme because it sounded awkward in design. Prior to downloading the entire OSD anyway and playing Frontier, of course. <laughs> but it wasn't until researching this monster's ecology that I discovered those three instruments mentioned earlier actually bear a crucially important role to the soundtrack's design. You see, Varosaborosu is an ancient relative of Diablos that once thrived in the desert. Due to a prolonged drought significantly affecting their food supply and having no water, these monsters were forced to leave their habitat and into a different one. That's more drier than a desert for some silly reason. And that reason still gets me to this day. In front of Shang Tian Almighty and every Wyverian in existence, with unknown intuition, this creature decided to move into a burning volcano because of a particular species of cactus that apparently grows there. For literally this reason alone, the Varosaborosu permanently stayed in this harsh environment, and, over time, began to adapt to it 
and drastically changed from an ordinary innocent desert animal into a ferocious devil after voring an entire factory of Diablo sauce. Those are the facts. Now, is it just me, or is that exactly what I'm hearing? Honestly, the more I listen to this theme, it just feels correct. Because a pair of blazing horns is a perfect example for biological adaptation. This theme combines both the aspects of a volcano and a desert manifested from the instruments themselves. It's already obvious which ones are portraying the volcano, but what I especially find the most interesting is that the violin, flute, and sitar play in such a unique fashion like they don't belong there. And that's just it. Those three specific instruments represent the desert. And the idea how both groups of instruments portraying each environment by struggling so hard to combine together is excellently designed. For one thing, nothing about it feels natural at all. And the entire time throughout the first segment, you can really hear how desperate the desert instruments sound, trying so hard to fit in with the brass. The flute especially feels like it's about to combust, giving that grating high-pitched whistle hurting everything. But the best part about all of this, they get used to it. As if they have finally become one with the volcano, and being forced to completely abandon the desert. EXACTLY like Varosaborosu's origins, forming the concept on reminding what it used to be and what it's now become by force, and there's no going back. Out of every Monster Hunter track that I've listened to so far, a pair of blazing horns has got to have the most detail when it comes to identity, and that's pretty damn fascinating because... It surprisingly works so well. Leaving Pandora's music box slightly ajar to unleash the original Rampage was a great way to start things off. Now let's lift up the cover and examine what other unique hidden gems it has for us to offer. To my own personal analogy of underappreciated frontier tracks, such as the exclusive rank-dependent area themes, this unique music catalog are mostly all grouped up as the lesser-known voices wanting to be heard, albeit not quite as loud as the others that hold a much larger message in protest, despite the title suggesting otherwise, but still an incredibly interesting take nonetheless. The bellowing stormy weather, or roar of stormy weather as it's sometimes called, is a naturally progressing area theme in low rank that's entirely built in a symphonic style. The G-rank version of this area, the Earth's Disaster Causing Rage, practically just about meets the same description I have for its low rank counterpart, extra rate of intensity being the only given difference. To shed some light on the details, symphonies, as a unique musical style in its own right, are more commonly identified for their constant shift in mood and speed, like chapters in the same story you're reading. Characteristically, the Highlands' two main novels of the same saga feature very enticing prospects identical to one another that perfectly contributes how it feels to progress in a hunt as a new recruit, along with the condition of the area simultaneously. By this I mean that the design of Low Rank Highlands theme can be interpreted in two different ways. To start off, I'm sure everyone here knows how it feels to begin a quest in a new area, right? It's like an awe-inspiring sight to behold, taking in all of the magnificent scenery around you, thus filling your mind with an ambition for adventure. As you're doing so, you discover the assigned monster that you need to go after. It's very close by to where you are, so you quickly hide behind the nearest structure of terrain you can find to avoid detection. But then, in a sudden turn of events, something provokes the monster foot-on-twig style, and it begins to check its surroundings, approaching closer and closer to the very spot from where you're hiding, until it finally spots you, angrily chasing you down and bringing you into a permanent state of panic. 
running for your life. The last segment specifically correlates redeemably well for that idea. Since if you listen very closely, you can hear distinct native chanting in the background, like they appear to be frantically scrambling all over the place in desperate urgency, written in nothing but danger. That is definitely one way of putting it into perspective. As for the secondary form of elemental construct, lies within the general suggestion of its title, the bellowing stormy weather. A gorgeous ray of light shining atop the gigantic mountainous landscape towering high above the sky, manifested in awe. But not long after, dark clouds begin to surround the air, consuming the light of day and replaces it with a raging thunderstorm, ceaselessly attacking everything with every powerful blow, until rain and thunder is all that remains of the beautiful climate. The once uplifting outset absorbed by the sun, destroyed by a storm, in a never-ending cycle, such is the dangerous life that is the Highlands. Whoa! A low-rank environment either building up the setting for a rookie hunter experiencing their job or the beautifully authentic natural changes of an area casting unstable weather conditions filled to the brim with imagery? Now that is something else of extraordinary. You know the best part about Frontier's area themes? Not one single precedent is derivative. As such, they're written with zero banal concepts, comprised of full-on originality, and always designed to take already existing elements familiarized in an ecosystem, the behavior of a specific monster, and innovates them to the best qualified result it can reach. Naturally preserved to the greatest value all the while. Most of the time, however, the music merges with both ideas, Although this in turn comes in part with a case of irony, since the direction initially taken for creating the area theme is inadvertent to a specific monster's background, to the extent where it becomes iconic, like Despair in the Searing Heat's percussion sounding very scorpion-like for Akura Mishimu, Unending Labyrinth's audible difficulty curve, more details on that soon, matching the ceaseless discharge of Espinos hearing the alarm go off in the morning, and Ancient Struggle to the Death being... well... Exactly that for Diragua. Now, Outfall of Grey Poison is the polar opposite of this regard. Clearly, this person, whoever they are, knew exactly what they were going for when composing this. It shouldn't require that much explanation on what the soundtrack means, since the message is clear as day. Setting that aside, this has always been one of my personal favorite area themes to listen to each time when I browse the sound library. It possesses a sinister and deeply foreboding aura that conceals the atmosphere in a residing conflict, leaking with dread, an ill omen displaying an unwelcoming prospect about meeting a sudden fate with an aquatic parasitic leviathan invasion that was designed for it, lurking somewhere deep within the treacherous waters of the swamp silently waiting for an approach. A story of an unlucky traveler falling victim to the bloodthirsty apex predator itself. What really gets to me the most about this music is how it perfectly encapsulates that exact idea by pure visualization alone. I can easily Picture someone wandering lost in the marshlands, surrounded by a blanket of fog covering the area, all the while as swarms of glaring bright red eyes pierce through the fog and surrounds the empty passageways of the swamp as a traveler slowly treads onward, hearing the growls, screeches, and howling in the distance, frightening them to the core nothing to defend themselves, brought down at their most vulnerable, causing them to pick up speed in full realization that danger is approaching, aimlessly scrambling around the area without a sense of direction, until suddenly, 
they catch a glimpse of a shadowy figure unfamiliar to them. Resembling a giant serpent crawling on the surface, the mere sight of its whip-like tongue triggers their fight-flight response in an instant to where they stumble backward trying to quickly turn back, which, in a horrifying turn of events, alerts the monster and begins to chase after them. Now noticing that their life is on the line, the Traveler violently sprints away from the creature as far as their legs can carry them, but the second they look back, the beast is starting to quickly catch up with them. Slithering closer and closer toward the horrified Traveler experiencing an ordeal like they've never imagined. The adrenaline rushing to their head, the petrifying fear in their eyes, their heart pounding through their chest like it's about to burst, running for dear life, doing everything they can to avoid capture from this hellish creature. And then, fades to white. The Traveler meets a silent, gruesome end. This is what I visualize every single time I listen to this soundtrack. Whether if it truly represents the tenacious nature of Baron Lugaru and the cataclysmic situation of any unfortunate innocent being encountering it, it's clear to perceive that outfall of grey poison builds the general feeling of the wild and the savage beasts that thrive in them, hiding in the thick underbrush to prepare for an unsuspected ambush in isolated fear. It immediately starts in suspense, drowning out the subtle croaking-like instrument resembling a frog, the only living aspect of the swamp, the flute creating a state of alarm like something bad is going to happen, replacing everything in agonizing conflict, growing more worse in each segment rushing through everything until it ends in disaster. Full stop. This area theme is brilliantly well put together in every aspect provided. I would utter the words and mispurpose through the tongue if I wasn't in a conversation with Satan and his female underlings for 2.16 minutes because now the hinges on Pandora's music box broke off and is releasing a concursion of sin into the air, by proxy. It should already be drilled into everyone's heads to know damn well what happens when you dare decide to strike a deal with the devil. You deserve everything what comes to you. But only here in a case like this, my actions were made deliberate. So feast your eyes and allow the hell-sent chaos bursting out from the broken seal officially commence. Eternal Flames of Disaster Awaken. That title cannot be any more descriptive. Before I even prepare to analyze the utmost quintessential emphasis of satanic qualities erupting through the exosphere, I'd first like to conclude any more than likely true assumption that everyone in the development team from Capcom Online Games reached a point where they began to unleash their inner demon for an expansion that holds true to its name, literally and figuratively. The former of which takes the idea of hell itself and renovates it to cataclysmic proportions. Just for the whole notion of distinguishing the very fire-based calamity of the same legendary black dragon that's literally born from anger and taking that very presentation to the extreme in every conceivable way imaginable. It genuinely astonishes me on how far Capcom took the premise for designing Crimson Fatalis in Frontier as the monster equivalent of Satan. Only ones that are foolish enough would detain to concur it as such. Because I must humbly implore to anyone that isn't familiar with the experience to pay attention. Hellfire Crimson Fatalis is the hardest monster of the four Conquest War challenges, just by the third phase alone. 
Prior to the Hunter's fatal mistake of carving their imminent demise, the fight starts off rather easy and not too much of a hassle to work with given its slow and predictable movement. But in truth, everything that happens is nothing more but a simple demonstration of Crimson Fatalis holding back from its true power. And by the time you eventually reach that point, hope to God you're prepared. Because I am not exaggerating when I say that all hell officially breaks loose in the form of the one and only Crimson Demon element. What could be best referred to as the very wrath of Crimson Fatalis itself. This element is exceedingly hazardous to the extent where it cannot be fully circumvented by defensive skills. Doubling down to a jaw-dropping, unprecedented scenario where you are gradually, or rapidly, taking unavoidable damage from the soul-consuming atmosphere cast by the dragon's seething anger alone. Not even cool drinks can protect you from the immolating temperatures. It's also worth noting that this hidden ability is only seen at the highest difficulty settings, where nearly every attack is a potential one-shot. Oh, and about the gut scale? Forget it. The monster's attack won't finish you off, but its breath of ire certainly will. Putting all of this into a gameplay perspective, Eternal Flames of Disaster Awaken is excellent as the setting to the final phase. It's a do-or-die situation that emerges out so suddenly to the extent where the previous music instantly disappears the very second the gigantic wall of lava towers over the arena. So sudden, in fact, that it needs a monster encounter audio cue right before the lava unveils the inferno of a storm. A perfectly fitting arrangement that expresses the idea of someone struggling through the fire and flames slowly closing in, burning all hope to ash and leaves despair. Mercy has been forsaken. Their fate has already been sealed, facing endless judgment. A more than expressive image of writhing fury that plays like an eternity. This music is the physical manifestation of burning in hell. The string instruments especially emphasize this greatly when you take the rapidly depleting health bar to consideration. And as for the vocals, they're just overly excited for what's already begun. The hunter has enraged Satan's incarnation, and now they must pay the ultimate price. Repent for your sins, or forever endure a life of pain and suffering. Everything about Crimson Fatalis and Frontier is intense as hell. Yeah, Capcom definitely went all out here. Descending into hell and ascending into heaven. Ironic. Too bad the eventual outcome here still isn't pretty. And yet... This one currently feels... oddly heroic. Actually, no. Hold on. What curse is spewing from my lips to call this meticulous diamond of flawless design as such for acceptable quality? Odd. What a worthless thing for me to say. The brilliant shine this gem exudes deserves much more than that. Especially from the celestial divine serpent that created it by sheer coincidence. Where do I even start with this? Do I just simply talk about the mystical elder dragon Shang Tian itself and spread more praise on his masterful presentation that many have witnessed like a gift to the eyes and call it a day? As much as this elder dragon truly is a beautiful sight to behold outside of and throughout battle, the third part of its album, or should I say Fire Emblem, contains something more valuable within this path of radiance. If I had to mark this outset for describing this music, although I still prefer Imperial Wrath of the Azure Dragon as favorite of the four themes for obvious transcribed reasons, close second being Azure Dragon's advent, Storm preceding the verge of death always struck me with unimaginable power that felt enlightening. A unique awakening that makes it feel as though that it's no longer about the monster itself, nor the raging thunderstorm it assembled to rise the birth of its anger, even though that it greatly intensifies with energy in the third part of the fight. 
but instead, the other way around. For the concept on how this medley progresses, Shang Tian is by far the most unique without question. It captures and enhances every waking element that gradually unfolds in the fight. From setting of the sky, to atmosphere of the ever-growing dangerous storm, to emotion of the entire situation. Phase 1 starts calm and relaxing, Phase 2 begins an upheaval to present warning, but Phase 3 is a fusion between the monster's feral weather instability and the amazing feeling of reaching close to the end of battle after what felt like days trying to fend off against this godlike power since the encounter. At least, that's how I'd like to interpret it anyway. But I seriously cannot get over how gorgeous the orchestral segment at the halfway mark sounds. I am enamored by the insane amount of triumph and victory imbuing from this. The flute beforehand gives off a different feeling altogether, which could possibly symbolize Shang Tian's anger, but then immediately after it plays the final note, the drums begin to build up with power and creates an explosion of victory. Bursting together all at once like a pillar of light reaching up to the heavens. Dancing in harmony. Screaming, this is it. Victory is at hand. This is your time to shine. Far into the horizon and plays out like a true grand finale. A reward in it of itself. All the time spent fighting against this god of the heavens will finally come to an end at last. An ethereal aura exuding with transcendent heroic symbolism given to you moments before revelation. And herein comes the best part about this entire setting. All of those insuperable feelings of victory are only there to drown out ANY evidence of Phase 4's catastrophic conclusion. Not a single hint of Shang Tian's infernal outrage is presented in this music. No fraction of there being a sudden outbreak at all. Zero foreshadowing from the instruments. It is extremely well hidden to the point where it makes you believe that you've already won. But the only sign available to obliterate those ridiculously empowering feelings of triumph conquering the skies lies within the title itself. Hands down, this soundtrack is the most unique in Shang Tian's entire medley. Though before I move on, I must point out one observation in the fight that fits spectacularly well with the music. The intense hurricane-like gusts of wind dancing in the background goes so damn perfectly with the violins in this segment. Absolutely beautiful. Recalling back to what I mentioned previously about Anandi Labyrinth's music structure having an audible difficulty curve, uh, quote unquote, since this is all just me speaking my mind here for how I interpret some of Frontier's area themes. The rather genuine, environmental, groovy outset heard prior in the Great Forest being swapped for an overzealous upheaval of fast-paced action is, to my eyes, a brilliant way to indicate how off the rails the experience of a haunt is starting to become. Since, in Frontier's natural, insidious standard for HR progression, HR5 is the official inauguration tour of the game strong arms you to the very back of the limousine and shifts the gears to maximum overdrive until you burst through the trunk. And it's no surprise to find out that some of the music takes the same route. The most distinguishing trait about a majority of Frontier's high rank themes is that it- Wait, 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 what was that? Come again? Well, now you tell me. 
Okay, slight correction. The most distinguishing trait about majority of these area themes in Ghost Shooter Rank is that it innovates and differentiates every aspect in a hunt to keep up with the game's difficulty pacing to the point where it feels as though that it's no longer holding back from anything. However, there is one exception to this that doesn't meet the following over-the-top soundtrack criteria. Instead of behaving like its own monster with the hardcore option toggled on, the Goshu Gorge area theme exhibits an extremely basic and slower approach that the radar often completely ignores. Which doesn't take that much to understand why Raging Fate is considered the least strongest, or just the general outlier of area themes in Frontier overall. At least in my, what say, portion of a full opinion. For a couple things that I sadly have to agree with, the repetitive buildup, linearity, and just the lack of anything special going on makes this music simply the most forgettable of the whole lot. Yet despite all of that, Raging Fate, to me, has an acquired taste of simplicity that's not at all weak in the slightest. Generally speaking, I mostly find it curious on how this area leads up to the Goshu Rank theme. At the start of this grand adventure, pun intended, the music that you're introduced to begins as an authentic, non-threatening composition sent at its most standard, playing out in a rather fun and light-hearted fashion, which is a great way to express low rank since the game is still taking things easy. But by the time when Goshu Rank is reached, Things suddenly take a dramatically different turn to indicate what the environment has developed into. And to reiterate, it's a very curious outlook to me. It isn't fast-paced, nor is it an overhaul of elements greatly enhancing the area itself like everything else is. No, that's not the case here. But instead, it's a quiet, regressive arrangement promoting a setting of endless, rising tension. This entire piece is comprised of authentic themes related to a canyon and its sheer immense size, coupled with deep, serious tones that feels intimidating, playing out like as if something horrible is about to happen. A warning for what's to come. An attack from nowhere that you're expecting to occur. Like the full awareness that something is keeping a watchful eye on you. Patiently waiting for the right moment. And yet, the setting continues to rise with pressure. Forever growing never subsiding. Yeah, it's certainly not the greatest thing to ever come from a Monster Hunter theme, but for what it's worth and what it gets done to indicate Goshu Rank's difficult nature, Raging Fate is an extremely simple yet effective idea nonetheless. Sometimes basic is the perfect route to make a message clear. A perfect example of true beauty casts in a veil of ugly deception. Genuine as it is wonderfully poetic by design, the strong aroma of the title, Petals Falling in Disarray, checks out in a flawless execution that really does not need any further detail to properly break down for description. A G-Rank area theme formerly perceived as nature's very personification, flowing like water in fertile soil, now receiving the gift of blessings from the bright sun's nurturing warmth so divine, and blooms into a luscious, colorful field of G-Rank standard material. There is, however, but one extremely vital bit of intel that I must respectfully point out in regards to what deception entails. 
that being the violin's once captivating performance being shredded apart by a foul note from the flute, causing the image of the flower field's perfume-like atmosphere to die out completely, thus proceeding to infect everything once fragrant to the senses with malignant fumes of chaos audibly expressed like a tornado savagely ripping into the fields and scattering everything in a full-bloom frenzy, all the while miraculously retaining the essence of beauty it still possesses regardless of how much damage is being done to it. That is amazing. The Gosho version will always be the best of the two themes of Flower Field. But I have a special attraction to the G-Rank version's Moments Before Disaster segment being sent as a reminder to what the experience has fully become. No longer the same flower field we once knew. Things have grown more frantic and spiraled out of control. But the symbol of beauty still remains. Forever preserved in a bouquet of luxury. Whoever comes up with these song names in Monster Hunter is a master of imagery craftsmanship. Petals falling in disarray is nothing short but a work of art. What more could I say? Ah yes, a masochist wet dream beckoned from negligent withdrawal. The multiplied aspect of deviance bred with insurgency, the notorious Xena species are a very special time of the ages for hunters. Thousands of eyes watching this have likely annihilated a thesaurus book when it comes to describing a monster undergone plastic surgery. So let's adhere away from any potential transcribed obligatory tangents for the time being, and allow the standard guild rank 2 to 400 introduction being the main focus. Emphasis on standard though, because just the very basic simplicity coming from the title is way too freaking ironic to call a ticket straight to purgatory an introduction. Zenith Fierce Battle and Demise don't need anything more to describe, because the rising intensity manages everything as it should to get the gist. But there's just something oddly hysterical to me for how the first Zenith Battle theme is entirely arranged as a monster and hunter greeting. Yeah, we all got the basic stuff from certain iconic beasts building up in character to demonstrate who they are and whatnot. Zynogre, Devil Joe, Bloodbath Diablos, Magnamalo, Basil Goose, Fatalis, it's all par for the course. But the Zenith species has a completely different story to tell, from its music to the point of comedy to my ears. I'm not sure if this was the intention or not, but it certainly does sound like it. Taking this in a veteran's perspective, Encountering a Zenith is generally like anything else to encounter in the Monster Hunter series. New monster, excited to fight it, weapon ready, let's see it in action! All of this goes double for the hardcore types of players longing to quench their challenge thirst, with an added lethal zest of morbid curiosity to see if they'll actually deliver. I can only imagine the look on their faces when they first received a taste of utter triple cart chaos from their first zenith. And it'd be even better if the extreme blight statuses were kept secret by Capcom until the Z update launched. That'd be way too goddamn perfect of a troll move if Capcom actually did that. Correct me if I'm wrong, because nothing says introduction more than losing your max HP, dash juices draining out in seconds, human ice sculpture, neurotoxins, actual blood loss, potions killing you, and dying of cardiac arrest coming from aggressively enhanced versions of standard monsters taking inspiration from an emperor's physical prowess making you their bitch. Everything about this music plays out like it's toying around with you in a charismatic and shameless fashion to represent what sort of circle of hell you've gotten yourself into. It starts out like nothing too serious is happening with easy to follow along tunes that feels almost enjoyable. 
but when the second part of the main melody plays in a lower tone, that's when the setting instantly changes for the worst. Every single time when I listen to each segment of dramatic buildup, I always hear it screaming all sorts of sudden exclamations in a what's happening and uh oh sort of manner. All the while constantly mocking you the entire time in a playful fashion without a care otherwise. Written in a situation like you've got the best of them and it shouldn't be that bad, and then the opposite happens. You don't. Here's a new species of monster. Have fun! And to think that this is meant as a short sample of what the Zeniths are fully capable of. Enough to make it feel like a From Software creation with callous exposition for fair punishment. This is honestly the kind of background music I'd hear from things like a silly death montage, or a showcase on what the fuck is going on in the world, both with equally fitting context. But in a case like this, it's everything associated to Monster Hunter gone horribly wrong. Dramatic action, fancy tricks cupped up its sleeve, and just plain damn silly overall. Yeah, I'd say that's a rather fascinating way to represent the greening of a new species and its unpredictable nature with music playing at the first tier. Make it feel like the game is playing you. I can tell the composer had fun making this one. Tell me. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of Unique Frontier soundtrack? If it's Inagami, then congratulations. Treat yourself the finest gourmet luxury meal the street cook has to offer at a free discount because you, my friend, are deserving of a compliment for having excellent taste. Let me tell you, I myself could not feel any more welcome to dig into this sacred treasure of forgotten times. I would have risked committing the forbidden act of treason and bamboo tortured as punishment if two of my brain cells fused together to generate the impossible image of leaving behind this artwork painted by a god of nature. It's what inspired the making of this video in the first place. How could I? Only a fool would take such a deadly gamble like that. There is no hope for survival against a pissed off wise and noble king nourishing the soil you're about to be buried under. I'm not that fool, I am its servant. The beauty of innovation can hold quite the obligation to carve the tools needed for quintessential quality of life material. And I say that like it's objective. Doubling down to the extent where a Monster Hunter soundtrack is heavily focused on actual instruments made out of bamboo to clearly represent the exact same elemental prowess coming from a monster that has complete control over it is absolute genius. The more notable one that plays throughout the main melody after the continuously rising orchestra reaches its peak is an Indonesian percussion instrument known as an angklong, an instrument similar to the shape of a xylophone made out of bamboo tubes creating a beautiful resonating pitch when struck. The sheer authenticity from this music's design is awe-inspiring on its own right for merit. But there's just something so incredibly mesmerizing about the Ong Klung in general. I don't have any other way to describe this. But the way that it's arranged within the melody legitimately sounds like as if it's opening up the book of a story. Possibly the backstory of Inagami's past. Unfolding the long since forgotten time of its once peaceful coexistence with humans in the bamboo forest following the betrayal of its own powers being used for selfish gain, and finally leading to the permanent conclusion that things haven't changed. And the very instant Inagami crosses eyes with a human, immediately right off the bat, it is personal. Yet despite all of that, at the same time, the music itself strangely doesn't feel all that aggressive to express the unfathomable hatred and fury Inagami has during the situation. Instead, it's calm and enlightening in an odd sort of way. Presumably the case for this is because it's trying to say that it's still an ancient god of nature. 
it's really difficult for me to explain, but the bottom line is that hearing this music when confronting Inagami doesn't feel like a warning. It's more like a test of strength to show what you're made of. Hence the amount of motivating action the music has all over. I don't know, perhaps I'm overthinking this too much. Although there is one last theoretical point of view that I'd like to jot down regarding the previously mentioned Rising Orchestra. The way that it starts off and ends with basic buildup continuously rising in higher notes acts like the rapid growth of a bamboo shoot the moment it's planted. The process has already begun and before you know it, it's become a full grown forest. Granted, that might not have been the intention since this is once again my own way of imagining things, as much as it does sound accurate. But regardless, Inagami Javon Dance is without question the crown jewel of everything that makes a Frontier soundtrack unique. If this video was a countdown, it'd be number one specifically because of how natural everything is. And the amount of effort Capcom put into this just for that very idea alone is amazing. Enough to the point where there's two versions of the theme that either emphasizes or de-emphasizes the Anklong, while the latter is drowned out for the former. What more could you need? Well, so much for this list being non-biased. Refrain from prying open a text box with criticizing fingers. I already know what you're thinking. Yes, I could have very well easily chosen the silhouette transformation over executives in a boardroom manifesting etheriality after hitting Cap's lock on the monster's name for a track title. And the former is very much so inspiring with musical depth since it literally shifts in between phases to go incredibly well in tandem for Miru's cryptic abilities, in addition to the sheer ingenuity of the music matching the monster's stats in each segment is also a redeemable trait for optimal design adaptation. In case it wasn't obvious enough to you already, Miru was going to be the initial participant to include in this category at one point. But alas, in the end... Unknown decided to invade at the last second and just can't leave my mind. Subjectively, by contrast, Miru is the lesser of two evils for the premise revolving around mystery. Unknown, on the other hand, is a deadly prognostic premonition that violently modifies the entire construct of mystery to unprecedented quantities of transcendence. I can wholeheartedly attest to the incredulous notion that an unoriginal concept of simply telling Rathian to go to hell and come back with a different name as a reskin is a jarringly impressive accomplishment for execution in Capcom's case, because clearly depth was the key bearing element gifted to something as linear as unknown. There is literally nothing else available to describe it. Unknown is a genuinely basic concept but it works so goddamn masterfully! People can give Capcom the benefit of the doubt and say that Unknown is an awesome frontier monster concept, but it falls short for being nothing more than a black Rathian. Yeah, last time I checked, Rathian doesn't poison you with its talons or invade you completely by chance. Such probabilities that are insanely low enough to the point where you never expect it to happen. But when it does, you are no longer a hunter, you are a victim. What gets to me the most about this music is just how sudden the standards of hunting have been mercilessly slaughtered. It's an arrangement so catastrophic and out of place that it invites something completely different to outright extract the context of Monster Hunter out of existence and replaces the natural primary qualitative formats behind a monster's battle theme with an ominous cloud generating with endless rage and insanity, arriving in sheer terror, raining down Armageddon all the while. Every waking second coming from this practically forces the contorted perception that this unforeseen cataclysmic demon of a flying wyvern is your worst living nightmare. 
composing a scale of omnipotent power ceaselessly rising with buildup, leaving behind not only chaos in its wake, but also unanswered questions that adds to the spontaneous experience. What does it want? Where did it come from? Why is it here? Is it even part of the frontier? Or something else entirely? No one knows. All that's known about this arch demon of the skies is that it has the body structure of Rathian, invades hunters by instinct, and casts an ordeal unto them that brings fearing the unknown to a whole new level entirely. And that's the beauty of it. At this time, we have reached the categorized Unique Area Themes Finality. An infinitesimal and endearing speck of land hiding in secret within the distant oceanic breeze. A small, refreshing subtropical paradise for four exclusives to call home, both where the light does and doesn't shine. And for this occasion to observe this place's hidden, fascinating contents, I chose Surface Value. More famously acquainted with a beyond innovative hybridized primate that is the Gogomoa, Tide Island by itself is a rather perplexing spectacle of an ecosystem. One half is peacefully calm and serene with energized blessings of nature, while the other half is completely buried as the exact opposite. If you decide to order KFC or partake unscrupulous assignments for orphaning a child in HR5, the former glorious outburst of unfiltered life promoting a brand new and exciting discovery becomes a frantically intense deforestation war zone wrought in conflict. You know, before coming to this conclusion, the area themes of Frontier in a gradual progressive standard are more unique than how we already view them as, meaning the elemental construct to represent the specified ecosystem's dramatic changes in music doesn't necessarily give the spotlight to the overall hostile hunting experience in general. And while decisive battle in the Southern Sea does provide those exact details to confirm the current situation as an environment going out of one's tree, uh, so to speak, there's also something oddly desperate about it as well for how it's presented. To avoid the circumstances of having this aspect go left unnoticed, the instrument's rapid and erratic movement is already right off the bat an excellent way to symbolize Gogomwa's behavior swinging all over the place, which is genius, all things considered. But to add more emphasis on the topic of desperate, at the same time, the way that it's built right from the ground up feels like as though that an instinct for survival has been activated. Like it's intended for either the hunters violently clashing their weapons against a monster defending its territory to the death, or the monster itself desperately trying to survive and escape with its life. Combine the subtle portions of distorted noises of pain at the end. Which is the personal selling point for why I find this soundtrack to be exceptionally unique. Considering the fact being that those distorted moan-like noises are the same ones heard in Gormagala, Chaotic Gormagala, and the Apex Monsters themes to symbolize disease and living through it. But in a case like this, I find it both intriguing and strange that an area theme of all things was gifted these corrupt connotations that's normally expressed in agonizing trauma. The Goshu area theme of Tide Island quickly swings into action to present a fierce battle against itself, constantly receiving damage, under attack losing the irreplaceable qualities of purifying light, bright and powerful as the sun prior, and manifesting the pain it's going through during a conflict that it doesn't want to be a part of. Perhaps the decisive part behind this theme is the concept for survival of the fittest. 
the more that I listen to Decisive Battle in the Southern Sea, the more I ponder over who or what it's intended for. In my perspective, it does not feel like the environment becoming dangerous, rather the damage done to it. Good thing everything's fully restored eventually in G-Rank. Standing here, I realize I might be cheating. Lo and behold to all who gaze upon the extravagant golden aura bursting in a world of light. None may understand that this standard for untold, irreplaceable value as an awe-inspiring angel of dignified praise ascends into the skies to deliver the mortifying conclusion that I have already described as Marvelous Performance as an honorable mention. But who's to say that there's no room for seconds? Only Alolan, Blastoise, Mega Evolved, Spyro, and PTSD aren't allowed for reiteration purposes. So to hell with sophisticated redundancies of stating what I can and can't identify as unique. Though my old accolade I gave to Clear Skies Died with Golden Light four years ago would seem to be suffice as the final verdict for insight. Accompanied with an admirably interesting orchestral performance consisting of a quarrel between percussion and brass continuously fighting on to prove that one is more worthy than the other. But the strings in the background grow more irritated for their constant argument, thus revealing their worthiness by ascending into the sky. Soaring with transcendence. And now, everyone has officially been deemed worthy. Marvelous. Satisfying and straightforward, but too much of a monologue to be remotely concise. I digress. While I do deeply admire each instrument fulfilling their job for transcending the concept of air battle to inconceivable proportions, and especially the outstanding, gorgeous ascension at the end to make eardrums instantly fall in love, there is one tiny and exceedingly important credential that's responsible to enable all of this heavenly glory arrive like a miracle. Percussion takes care of the airship's pavement, Strings covers the sky's incredible horizon, Sitar vividly expresses the golden dust decorating the atmosphere, and what's the brass responsible for? The powerful gusts of wind. Garaba Deora's binary tactic for opposition. Hearing the tubas unleash the mightiest blast in nearly the entire length of the track by literally screaming air battle is just top peak performance. With so much built-in volume to outright devour the rest of the instruments, the empowering strength bellowing from the brass symbolizes the wind element so tremendously that it's as if you can legitimately feel the force of wind coming from the music itself, as it quite literally blows everything away. That's what it feels like to me every single time I listen to this piece. But the overall instrumental concept of clear skies dyed with golden light goes spectacularly well with the setting. For how the wind element is set in place, You'd expect immense levels of unstable destruction shredding the scene like a hurricane, just like the force of nature Kushala Deora is. But Ganaba Deora presents the awesome weather prowess like a sacred guardian of the sky, and gradually unveils the beauty of its presence like a rainbow proving what it's worth. Priceless. And this is just me once again tossing in extra interpretations for the basis of how downright epic the brass sounds. You know those specific scenes in anime where a character's fall or coat is shown aggressively swaying in the wind each time when they perform a signature attack using a badass pose while everything erupts behind them? Visualizing that when listening to this music just makes it feel even more epic and I love it. 
when the presence of golden scales and diamond shards precedes a fierce battle in the skies. The beast awakens the power of wind and ascends into the atmosphere toward a higher place of majesty. Speaking of which... and a higher place which you'll arrive to indeed. Not just any ordinary vacancy compartment for hunters to seek relief away from the intense environment. Here in Mezaporta, this transparent capital of the franchise contains more value just as well as a heaping roster that coincides alongside it. So it'd be boring and frankly unbalanced to not include at least one of these numerous hub areas background music into this category. Likewise, there is an equating amount of beauty in Frontiers music outside of a hunt, and the one area in Mezaporta involving extra personal achievements to the extent of feeling like a king when you step foot inside speaks to me in ways that I could have never possibly imagined. Let me rephrase that by asking you this. How often in the franchise does a Monster Hunter game portray you as an icon of respect and glory, music-wise? Other than proof of a hero, that's basically it. I don't really recall a time where a Monster Hunter game treats you like a well-established trophy of some limnity for what you've overcome throughout your journey, set at a caliber this tremendously high for emphasis. Because SR Challenge Room is one of those exact, surprisingly rare moments that blows it out of the water like a fountain of dreams. The first time I heard this music, I was floored by the insane amount of royalty it contained. Which is quite honestly the very last thing I'd ever expect to hear come out from a Monster Hunter game. And yet, Mezzaporta took the extra mile by providing exactly that, and then some. Every waking second from this plays like a ceremony in a royal palace. A humble greeting promoted with undying respect to the one who has earned the rightful heir to the throne. The noble and borderline patriotic fanfare melody represented like soldiers swearing allegiance to their country with an insuperable fighting spirit. The radiant aura imbuing with unwavering independence in sovereign domain and the amazing feeling of that one person in a higher authority reveling the sights of everyone around him, expressing their prestige for how much they view him as a true hero, deserving the crown for achievement. Toward a higher place is the anthem of a frontier warrior given to you like a medal of recognition. The moment you walk in the SR challenge room, immediately without hesitation, you are basked in glory. Talk about generous, yet infuriatingly ironic at the same time for all the wrong reasons, because I have no idea why it's so damn underrated. It literally deserves more praise, and it pains me to say that. It may not be much according to a lot of people out there, but trust me, there is a lot to talk about this one. Digging into genuine simplicity once again for the establishing factor of basic effectiveness, and it'd be highly irrational of me to step away from one of many perfect occasions like this, and why I chose it to begin with. Because I assure you, it's all within good reason. For how this is going to be set in place, I will decompose the soundtrack into several separate unique categories of its own. These include the presentation, identity, context, and development of the music that further classifies what it means. Immediately right from the start, this music invokes the feeling of shock, like someone has witnessed the sight of something that causes them to gasp in terror in a very sudden and alarming-like fashion 
that details how spine-chilling the encounter is, and the drum paired with the brass instrument interchanging the same rhythm together in unison creates an impact that really sets the tone of immense pressure and weight that's felt in the current situation. Which I find to be the best part that truly makes this music stand out the most. Since those exact feelings of immense pressure and weight is built with so much power to emphasize the monster's resounding footsteps echoing in the distance and trembling the earth. Likewise, the music itself feels heavy, and it reiterates throughout the track added with more disturbing elements to clearly portray the prehistoric behemoth approaching directly to you as its prey. It's an extraordinarily simple composition that's designed to make one feel defenseless and intimidated by Abiorgu's presence, therefore enabling a great sense of danger that is most definitely, indeed, ferocious. Additionally, I really like the general concept of how raw the ferocious predator is arranged with very little need for identification. That in and of itself is all kinds of unique, because monsters with their own battle track that we're all closely acquainted to as hunters usually have distinct chords, instruments, and styles to give them exquisite personalities for who they are. Alatrion's deliberate inconsistency with a whole plethora of instruments for its elemental instability, Glavinus starts off dull on the edges and increasingly becomes more sharper and dominant like a sword exactly how it is in battle, Camellios literally adapting to its surroundings and eventually comes out of hiding to match its sneaky and elusive behavior. So what's Abiorgu supposed to be? Nothing. No element. No secret. No special characteristic. The powerful footsteps, disturbing chords, and intimidating presentation is all that it needs to tell you that what you are witnessing is an actual, legitimate, frightening monster. Okay, sure, but it's just a basic Devil Joe clone that has the same exact animations and attacks with hardly any given difference. Why should I care about a frontier monster that's a criminal for identity theft aside from inspiring Glavinus? See, that's the thing. Abiorgu is the kind of reskin that's intended to be taken seriously from the start. And you might be wondering, what does any of that have to do with its music? Because this theme only plays during low rank, and Abiorgu is the only standard monster in the entire game that has its own rank medley. What you are hearing is the start of this monster's characterization. Simple, basic, and intimidating. In a way, due to this concept, it's almost like the lack of identity from the ferocious predator was justified enough for the sole intention of wanting to be taken seriously, since everything about Abiorgu gradually develops into its own monster and finalizes itself by acquiring an identity classification. At first, when you encounter the monster as a rookie hunter, the music plays like a dinosaur walking in an interestingly non-provocative manner with very subtle bits of anger to it, as if the hunter and Abiorgu are simply unwelcomed with each other's presence in different corresponding emotions. But in time, when you evolve as a hunter by progressing through the ranks, Abiorgu follows by doing the same and everything prior to trespassing Brute Wyvern territory delivers the exact same message as before by amplifying the once basic raw elements to far deadlier proportions and built with extra intensity for a true raw experience. Abiorgu's back, filled with a vengeance and better than ever. And a new friend. What I personally love the most about the Ferocious Predator more than Wicked Despair Scattering Fang, even though that I prefer the second theme overall melody-wise, is how masterfully authentic the context is to classify something as remarkably basic and effective like the Abiorgu as a legitimate monster. Not only that, but it's got every characteristic available to represent the entire classification of brute wyverns in general. Big, 
dominant, ruthless, deadly, and ferocious. The true forces of nature that knows how to bring the pain and deliver the ultimate struggle to hunters. And if you ask me, Abiyorgu isn't just a brute wyvern, he is the brute wyvern. The flagship of Monster Hunter Frontier Forward 2, the ferocious wyvern, dubbed Dino Crisis. You don't need an element or a special ability to be unique, because it's who you are that matters the most. And Abiyorgu's low rank theme is perfect by keeping things simple in the best way possible. The familiar, unpleasant scene developing into something new. Yeah, I kind of like this monster. I guess you might call this one a dark finale. To cut straight to the point for filling in this final blank canvas before it evolves into one of my derivative tangents, the one distinct characteristic that always stood out to me the most in Monster Hunter's hub themes is the atmospherical proportions shining down on the villagers, carrying out with energy so strong to fill the player with confidence and that there's nothing to fear. Poke, Kokoto, Moga, and Valhabar easily come to mind sharing this idea. Despite the dangers that emanate less than a mile away from the village, the sign of hunters are always built strong to alleviate any potential threats to places they call home. Likewise, as long as there's hunters, peace always remains in a village. And very rarely do these senses of imminent danger cause the atmosphere in a hub area's music to change into a much darker setting that rebukes the whole rely on confidence initiative bestowed by a hunter's presence. Now, Frontier's Mesoporta Square is a very interesting case. More times than not, the primary core musical essence that alternates in color is often set in a positive outlook that gives the area a vibrant sense of extravagant living and knowingly infected with limitless joy. Just like the isolated, endearing community paradise it is by nature. The default main theme song of Mesoporta Wind varies depending on seasons and events that cycle throughout specific times. And there are a lot to choose from that deserves as much equal recognition as the rest of the unique non-monster related themes. Toward a Higher Place was a great way to carve this disappointingly underrated outset. So let's end it with surface value, albeit subjectively not as expensive as the latter contenders like Halloween's contagious festivity, Christmas's angelic beauty, and anniversary making me want to be a part of the audience, but still very much so equally admiring and worthy enough to have its own spot. Mesoporta Wind Ancient Dragon Attack comfortably earns this spot for owning unique musical identity that truly behaves like its own beast. That by itself is incredibly surprising to hear come from a hub theme, because like I said earlier, Equal the to tour to higher place forming solemn glory, dark settings in Monster Hunter outside of battle is nearly non-existent in its music. Furthermore, when you put the standard dead serious tone into consideration for the majority of the series, with and without Elder Dragons included to injure a village's social integrity, it's also a highly unusual idea to occur throughout the franchise since the hub area's music remains undeterred each time when either the game's flagship or some other supernatural creature of timeless destruction arrives on the scene. As quaint as it is for music concepts like this not happening as often as they should, at the same time, it makes sense that they don't abstain from their self-security because they're only dealing with one monster, to be fair. Not multiple of them. As far as I'm aware, this is the second time in the series where a hub area theme is greeted with darkness. The first being Four Ultimates' warlike battlegrounds in Dundorma when rusted Kushala Deora began to assault. 
which, as you can clearly tell by the lack of Mezzaporta square footage that plays this piece, is what the setting instantly reminds me of most. I really don't know for certain on what the backdrop of Mezzaporta looks like during this event, but all that I have for confirmation is that this music plays during a special period where the player participates in a huntathon containing nothing but Elder Dragons, and Mezzaporta Wind Ancient Dragon Attack expressively justifies the exact genuine feeling of immense turmoil dripping on one's forehead. Throughout the first half of this soundtrack, a profound darkness enters the area that would make anyone scared for their life. Charm and endearing enthusiasm heard days prior, now brought into a state of paralysis from the invasion cast before the residents of Mesoporta, rendered weak and defenseless. A dark prognostic scroll unveiling the very omen prophesied in folklore now manifests the skies and looms over one's head in swarms. All brought together to paint the atmosphere in an ominous shade as a presence of hordes of elder dragons now haunts Mesoporta Square. But even with all of this turbulence ravaging the skies, the presence of hunters are far too great, as the tiniest fragment of hope that was presumed abandoned still lives within the unbreakable communion melody of Mezzaporta Wind, playing out like as if that is trying to calm itself down, ease the overwhelming tension that afflicts them. With very noticeable bits of hesitancy, the main theme of Mezzaporta gently passes by to soothe all that's been struck with fear, sent out as a reminder that it is the soul of a community who won't ever leave it behind. There is nothing to be afraid of. Stay calm and let the hunters take care of the situation. A disturbingly relaxing hub area theme that coalesces within the atmosphere like a blessing in disguise. That is beautifully unique. There's literally nothing else quite like this. Absolutely amazing. So there you have it. Those are the 15 soundtracks in Monster Hunter Frontier that I've selected as unique. Feel free to share your own thoughts and observations from other Frontier tracks like it down below in the comments. I'd be happy to respond. Thank you so much for watching. This has been GBA049, signing out, going offline, see you next mission, and please give the rest of Frontier's non-monster soundtracks more love.